Okay, um, so hello everybody. I have uh, now, I have, uh, well, made my mind up what you could prepare for, yeah, for these sessions where there is, uh, well, there are no lecture notes yet, which means these two sessions about anomalies and uh, these three sessions about tetrahedral phenomenology. Um, so, okay, and I printed in that sense a new timetable with some suggestions what to do there. I really had a hard time to find something uh, elementary about anomalies, actually. Um, but, uh, I mean, you will see, I, I formulated the, the idea what you should prepare. I formulated this very, um, well, very cautiously. Uh, that you should get an idea what these uh, reviews or well meant to be pedagogical papers are about. Um, so have a try. I mean, don't, don't expect that uh, by reading it once you expect uh, you you understand um, each aspect. I mean, this is really technically complicated stuff. But uh, yeah. So basically, what I now uh, dig out is is one article which describes on the level of quantum mechanics what anomalies are about. Uh, this was written for, for a journal uh, which basically addresses educational issues uh, for physics. Um, so I think the, in principle, the, the audience which is supposed to read that are probably, uh, well, high school teachers, physics teachers and also I mean, probably lecturers for colleges, for undergrad colleges. Uh, and the other article is just, in a sense, from uh, so-called uh, Scholarpedia. So this is an, well, an improved version of Wikipedia with some review articles, which are also well written in a way that it's, um, well, does not contain too much formulas, but just gives the, con the conceptual point of view. So I hope this is uh, this is helpful for preparation. Um, and then concerning the um, hadron phenomenology, what I would like you to do is to dig a little bit into particle properties, and they are documented in this uh, in this biannual review of the particle data group. So just uh, I've given a link, and I mean this link shows up several times also in the upcoming tasks. Uh, so I want you to get a little bit familiar with these uh, with these uh, tables of particle properties, um, and then just look through that, figure out which particles live long, which do not live so long, and uh, and what are their decay channels. And I mean, already make your mind up if you can understand some issues there: why certain decays do not show up, why certain decays are rare why certain decays show up and so on. Um, okay, then back to, um, to path integrals. So last time I've basically in the end summarized um, how one can rewrite specific expectation values in terms of path integrals and I have appointed to the time independent um, operators and their expectation values that one can calculate uh, these expectation values by Monte Carlo integration methods. And uh, today I would like to show you some um, examples of, of operators which one can attack indeed by these Monte, Monte Carlo uh, methods. Um, and I still stick to quantum mechanics for that, and in the end, um, we translate all that to quantum field theory. And then, uh, when we meet next time, which I think is on Thursday, I will show you results from from lattice QCD, um, and yeah, and basically discuss these results that that you uh, to put them into perspective. Okay, so today we still stick with quantum mechanics um, and look at some. Examples which, of course, I designed such that uh, their corresponding 
things in quantum field theory is exactly what one calculates, for example, with a strong interaction and lattice QCD. <coughs> So examples for time independent operators. And uh, basically, I give you two examples. One is an example which one exactly uses to calculate masses of hadrons within lattice QCD. Uh, well, whatever are masses in quantum field theory basically translates in quantum mechanics to energy levels. So what I would like to show you is how to determine some energy levels of a considered system. To start out, let me first um, write down something actually for time-dependent operators which I, anyway, already have frequently used, how to come from the Schrödinger to the Heisenberg picture and back, so how to uh, basically transport the time information from states to operators and, uh, and back. <coughs> um, so we recall the relation between um, the Heisenberg and the Schrödinger picture. So if you have an operator which depends on T, um, this is in the Heisenberg picture then, I can obtain that provided I know the Hamiltonian and provided the Hamiltonian itself is time independent in the following way. I just start with an operator say at time equals zero which I can regard then as an operator in the Schrödinger picture because then for in the Schrödinger picture for later times well it is time independent so I can take it at any time I like. Um, and then I basically uh, do this unitary transformation and this brings me uh, basically from a time-dependent operator to a time-independent one or to the one at a specific initial time. So why do I write this down when I'm interested in time-independent operators? Well, because we can do something for these Euclidean times, which I have introduced last time, so one can translate this here um, to Euclidean times, but Euclidean times I can actually simulate by Monte Carlo uh, methods, because for the time-dependent operators, these path integrals had always these exponentials with some um, imaginary objects in the exponent, where I basically argued this one cannot easily simulate numerically um, whereas if one goes basically to this beta or goes to uh, in general Euclidean time uh, basically it goes to imaginary time then what one uh, well then this representation in terms of path integrals uh, is just has real valued exponents which in additionally are damped and therefore one can simulate this numerically. Okay, so the issue is if I go to an imaginary time, so replacing this t by an imaginary number, now the tor is real again. However, this here is an analytic um, expression, so I literally can, translate, can replace the t by minus i tor. And what I obtain then is e to the h tall sub operator at zero e to the minus h tall. And now we consider the following um, correlation function.
which I call C, and it depends on my variable tor. And I define this as a trace of e to the minus beta h. You know this from, uh, uh, from well, two <coughs> sessions ago. And then let me plug in something which actually does not depend on real time. So I plug in this operator here. I plug in a second operator, actually this one at uh, time zero. And I want to look at this quantity for, well, like before, for beta going to infinity. And in addition, I would like that this tor here is also large. Not as large as beta, um, but uh, we will see in a moment how large it should actually be. So first of all, this object here does not depend on a real-time variable. And therefore, one can go through the very same steps as we did now uh, last time and uh, in the uh, session before, and translate all this to a path integral, to a path integral which has this form that one can simulate by Monte Carlo. So I don't do this again now. Um, I mean, if you don't believe me, just go through all these steps and you will see indeed one can uh, exactly rewrite it in, the, in, a, in a proper way. Um, um, okay, so let me write this down. So this can be calculated Monte Carlo integration. From the so-called <coughs> Euclidean path integral. So this I don't want to repeat now, but of course I want to show you what is the meaning of this quantity. What can I use this here for? To do that, um, well, we, re we rewrite it a little bit. function shows up if one rewrites it again in terms of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Again, this is not something which we know automatically. That's why we calculate this here by Monte Carlo integrations. But I will basically rewrite it such that we can read off something very useful from this correlator. And then the logic is uh, well, that we have an interpretation of what we read off, and we do the numerics here. Okay, so um, I'm interested in this trace here of, uh, and actually there was something wrong here. Uh, what I want here is, I have not said anything whether this operator here is uh, emission. And especially even if it is her mission, maybe it uh, does not remain her mission uh, if I go to imaginary times. Um, so, <coughs> so let's look here at an O dagger O. We will see that this is gives a useful expression in the end. Um, okay, so I look now at this object here. And I evaluate that by a complete set of states, which I take to be eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And um, well, what I do now is I, I 
basically insert a complete set of states here as a unity and I write this trace as a sum over a complete set of states. And I label my states um, by m and n and my corresponding wave functions are these psi n guys. Then I plug in um, what I know about any operator evaluated at an imaginary time, which is this here. This is true for any operator, so it's also true for an O dagger. So this is e to the power of tau h. My operator dagger at zero, e to the minus tau h. And um, then I want to insert a complete set of states here. And finally have this operator here, and now I have to finish this trace, which I uh, do by all well, these psi n states. I have to complete this trace. Um, okay, as always, the, the reason why one introduces these eigenstates of energy is, well, if I do that, I can evaluate the action of these operators, the Hamiltonian, on these states. And also here. Okay, so this is a sum Mn. Um, if this here acts to the left on this state, it produces an eigenvalue En, so I can replace here the operator H by En, um, and uh, pull it out from this expectation value. This is e to the minus theta um, minus theta minus four En. Then I have um, from the action of this guy on psi m, I produce an eigenvalue Em, and I can also pull that out. So this is e to the minus tau e m psi n operator dagger um, psi m and um, well this I just copy here now what you see here is actually a modulus square you see here uh, a matrix element psi m operator psi n, and whatever is a bra here is a cat here, and what is a cat here is a bra here, and instead of O, I have O dagger. So this is exactly the complex conjugate to that. So there is uh, one more way how to rewrite this as e to the minus theta minus tau e n and e to the minus for e m and then the modulus square of psi m um, yeah. operator psi n modulus square Okay, so this here actually describes the transition, in a sense the transition probability of a state psi n when I act with the operator on it and then I basically ask does it contain, does this state here uh, contain a part proportional to psi m. So basically it gives the this mediates the transition of a state n to a state m. Okay, we will come back to that in a moment. Um, now let's analyze this here. The idea is, like before, that beta is very, very big. 
which means I have here exponents e to the minus, uh, and the idea is that beta is, of course, also much bigger than, than tau. So the, the hierarchy is tau is large, but beta minus tau is even larger. Because beta should go to infinity, tau should, well, not go to infinity, but become rather large. If beta goes to infinity, beta minus tau also goes to infinity, which means this here is dominated by the smallest possible energy. All the rest is much larger suppressed. This is what I argued also uh, some days ago. So this whole thing is dominated by the lowest energetic state, and the lowest energetic state is, by construction, the vacuum state. So, um, <clears throat> so for beta large, this is dominated <coughs> by uh, smallest en. In other words. Um, vacuum <coughs> for beta large. Actually, then also beta minus tau is large. So for this beta being very, very large, um, <coughs> I just write down now only the vacuum state which dominates the whole sum and drop the rest. This is what this approximation sign here means. Um, so this goes with e to the minus beta minus tau times e vacuum. Um, so I've approximated the sum over m by just its dominant term, but I still have the sum over m here. The sum over m goes with e to the minus tau e m. And then what I've left is still, of course, uh, this transition. Okay, let me write this here in the next line. Um, I have now the transition of, well, the vacuum state. And then I act with the operator on it, and then I ask, about the overlap with an arbitrary state here. So I have reduced my sum over n to the dominant one by letting beta grow. And now next, um, I let the tau grow. The idea is that beta is extremely large, but also tau is large. So, what would be here the dominating part? What do you think? So, I have a factor e to the minus tau. Tau becomes is positive and becomes big. So, which term would dominate this sum? So first of all, if I don't tell you anything about this operator, also the vacuum would dominate that. This is actually the case we are not interested in. But this will become an issue uh, latest next time when we look at latest, latest data, latest QCD data. Uh, so indeed, in general, of course, there can be an overlap so there can be a non-vanishing value of psi vacuum operator psi vacuum. Nothing wrong with that. And if this is the case, then this sum here would be dominated also by the vacuum contribution. So in general, the M sum 
is also dominated by um, M by the vacuum state. But just uh, at the moment, just for fun, let's consider the possibility that the expectation value of this operator here with respect to the vacuum, that this is zero. And I mean now strictly zero, not something small, because if it's only small, <coughs> still for large enough tall, this would be the dominant contribution. But let's suppose this is zero. Then, well, then this can couple to other states, not necessarily to Psi 1 or to Psi 2, this of course depends now on the details of this operator, but it couples to some states and for sure this sum here is then dominated by the lowest M where this object here is non-vanishing at the lowest EM. And now we give a name to that, first of all. So what we want is that this here is zero, but of course something must be non-zero. There must be states uh, where something is non-zero. In a moment I will give you an example for such an operator, um, or what this such an operator should do, but let's first uh, get the uh, Let's first uh, calculate this a little bit further. Um, so let us give a name to a state M, where this where this um, this overlap matrix element is non-vanishing, and I take the one where the corresponding energy is the lowest of all these of all these uh, states. Psi M, where one has a non-vanishing transition. Um, <clears throat> so I call this Psi now O, so that it corresponds to my operator here. <clears throat> now uh, let this be the state with lowest energy, um, and I also call this EO now, such that psi operator O, operator at zero, psi vacuum is non vanishing so basically I look for all states psi where this is non-vanishing and I sort them and figure out which of them has the lowest energy. And this I call psi O. <coughs> then what I obtain is for large enough values of tau, this will be the dominant part in my m sum here. Okay, so, but let me stress, um, tau large does not mean that it becomes comparable to beta. I really want the sequence beta very large, tau large. Okay, then this C of tau is approximately, well, given by this expression here, and from this sum, I just take this one state 
psi O and the corresponding energy E O. So first of all I have this coefficient e to the minus beta minus tau times E vacuum. Then this next exponential is dominated by E O. And uh, the, the matrix element which remains is here psi O, this operator psi vacuum squared. <coughs> And now let me look at one specific quantity which basically produces this energy here. Well, let me look at minus d d tau of the log of this c of tau. Well, why do I do that? Well, if I take the log of this product, this reduces to the sum of logs. And then when I take the derivative with respect to tau, all the terms which do not depend on tau, they just drop out. So the log of this guy is the log of this, which is the exponent, plus the log of this, which is again the exponent, plus the log of this, which does not depend on tau. Therefore, after taking this, this goes away. And uh, what's left then with this additional minus here is actually... So again, approximately for large tau and even larger beta, this is E O minus E vacuum. What does this here mean? So well, what does this here together with that mean? This means that this operator here has quantum numbers different from the vacuum. This operator has quantum numbers, this means uh, something with which I can characterize my states in addition to energy. When I talk about quantum numbers, these are conserved things, they characterize my states. If this operator, when acting on the vacuum, creates something with non-trivial quantum numbers, with a quantum number which the vacuum does not have. Then, of course, this means that this state here has this quantum number. Examples. Well, we know about conserved or approximately conserved quantum numbers. Strangeness, baryon number, something with a negative parity, because the vacuum has positive parity. Isospin, not exactly a quantum number, but approximately. So if I have an operator here, which has, for example, baryon number, so suppose now, I mean, I go now to quantum field theory, where one writes down very, very similar things. I write down an operator with, for example, three quarks. This has a non-vanishing baryon number. But the vacuum has vanishing baryon number, which means this here will for sure be zero. But of course there are eigenstates where uh, this lower uh, transition amplitude is not zero. For example, all the states which have a baryon number one. Well, among these states are, well, all hadrons. Among these states with baryon number one is the proton or the neutron or another baryon resonance. I can even be more specific and basically write down an operator, or I can try to write that down, an operator which has exactly the quantum numbers of the proton. Still, this operator will couple to several states. There is not only one hadron state which has the quantum numbers of the proton. There are several hadron states. There are baryon resonances which have the quantum numbers of the proton. But 
for large tau, I'm sensitive to the lowest of them. And the lowest of them is actually the proton. By definition, the proton is the, the lightest barium. Well, we have not found a lighter one. Uh, if it was not the lightest, uh, probably it would decay into a pion plus, then the lighter one. And the proton is stable, and the reason why it's stable, we believe, is that it is the lowest hadronic state, with baryon number one. Which means if I can find an operator which has the quantum numbers of the proton, it does not matter how strongly it couples to the proton. Maybe this is an operator which couples more stronger to other states. However, uh, this would be encoded in here. But this is anyway only a coefficient. What I'm sensitive to is this here, as long as I go to large tau and to even larger beta. Then I'm for sure sensitive to one combination of states, and this is the vacuum and the lowest state, which has the quantum numbers of the operator, which I've written down. So I can use this on the level of quarks to learn something about the hadrons. Because I have not specified at all in detail what this operator must do as long as it has the right quantum numbers. As long as it has the quantum numbers I want to know something about. And this is exactly what's done on the lattice. Um, so let me first uh, finish that. Um, so this here yields um, the energy of the lowest state with quantum numbers of my operator. <coughs> and I should say it's completely meaningful that here this difference appears because this is how we characterize our states. What we call mass of a particle or energy is actually the energy relative to the situation that this particle is not here. And this, that this particle is not here is the vacuum. So I want to measure actually an energy difference. Exactly what I see here. So what I call here energy is the energy relative um, to the vacuum. This is something very good. Because it gives us exactly the information we are after. It does not give us things which might be complicated to interpret, like an absolute energy. Um, an absolute energy is something, for example, one is after when analyzing dark energy. Gravity couples, in a sense, to absolute energy, not to energy differences. However, for practical purposes in particle physics, where gravity is basically irrelevant, we are not interested in absolute energies, we are interested in the energy relative to the situation where nothing is there. And fortunately, this quantity does not bother in detail about these energies, it just gives us the energy difference. So that's very nice. Now the, the practical um, application goes basically the other direction as I have derived it here. I want to know this here. So I look at this quantity for tau large and beta even larger. And remember this quantity is basically this. But this quantity 
I can address by Monte Carlo integrations. So what one actually does is one in lattice QCD one puts an operator into the system at uh, well basically time zero. One has a four-dimensional grid. I mean, so far I only talked about a one-dimensional uh, grid in in tall. Um, if I have excitations on every space point, I actually in the end have a four-dimensional grid. This is something to which we will come to. Um, I put a second operator, the adjoint, at a different grid point. Actually, it does not matter in practice in which direction I go because of uh, Poincaré invariance, boost invariance, rotations in four-dimensional space. So I put some operators with the quantum number of the object I'm interested in, say I put a three quark operator when I'm interested in the proton, somewhere at some uh, site of my lattice, and I put the joint operator at a different site. Okay? Then I calculate this expectation value here by Monte Carlo, and then I repeat the calculation but increasing the distance of the two. And this I do several times. And then I basically well, take the log of what I have determined, and from this quantity I calculate the slope. Because this is exactly what this derivative does. It determines the slope when I look at this correlator for a given tall, then for a larger one, for a larger one, for a larger one. And the issue is that in the beginning, when tall is not very big, this will be influenced by several values of m. But their influence decreases and decreases, and one can see that at some point, the whole thing is just exponential. So what one does is one tries to fit it, for example, with a superposition of several exponentials, and only when one sees it's really dominated by one exponential and not by a superposition, then one, then one says, okay, now I have reached a large enough tau that I can read off the lowest energetic state. Okay, so this is something which is really done in practice um, by calculating this numerically and varying the distance between these two operators and looking how the, this correlation function changes. Good, now we make a break till quarter past two and then I present you a second object which one can calculate uh, on the lattice. What you should basically take home from this series that Whenever you see mass extractions from lattice QCD, this is exactly how this is done there. One just has to find appropriate operators, while well, the operators which have the quantum numbers you want to study. Okay. <coughs> 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 okay, let's continue. So. I want to present you a second quantity, um, which is, well, in the end, static. Uh, now, this is something which is even closer to actually something which is non-static. Remember, some, uh, some days ago, it was probably in the first lecture or in the second, um, where I already discussed a little bit qualitatively what one can expect from lattice QCD. Um, and there was the issue of parton distributions. Parton distributions uh, basically tell something of which fraction of momentum of a hadron is, um, uh, well, is di distributed to a given quark or gluon. And obviously when I talk about momentum fractions, I mean this is something which is very dynamical. I mean, momenta. Uh, this is something which one probes by scattering, for example, electrons on hadrons or hadrons on hadrons, and there one probes with pattern distributions. So this is 
a very dynamical quantity. And um, Joachim asked that time, so how can that be? You said lattice QCD only addresses static quantities, uh, but there are calculations of these Pato distributions functions on the lattice, and I will show them uh, on Thursday. Um, actually, what's calculated there are moments of such energy or momentum distributions. And what I would like to show you now is that indeed, even if one has a dynamical quantity, if one does, so a quantity which depends on time, if one does a Fourier transform to the energy variable and calculates moments of this Fourier transform, then one can rewrite this a little bit until one ends up with a static quantity. Um, okay, so which, okay, let me first do that and then uh, I comment on in which sense one can afterwards then reconstruct the whole energy dependent quantity. Um, so my example B for a time independent quantity is uh, one can calculate moments of the Fourier transform um, of now seriously something in time, a temporal correlation. <clears throat> okay, for that let me define first this Fourier transform f of e, which I want to obtain by an integral over time with a factor e to the i e t, and then I have something which is an expectation value, for example, the vacuum here. Actually, it does not matter what I do here in detail. I want to look again at the correlation function, so of this operator, but now seriously in time. So basically how you could understand that is you start out with something, for example the vacuum state, you create the object you are interested in, um, <coughs> let it propagate till the time t and then you take it out of the system and ask again about your, the state which you had initially. Uh, so this is a very dynamical information. And now what I do is I uh, calculate from this dynamical information the Fourier transform. <coughs> and the trick now is I want to show you that uh, moments of this distribution, in spite of the fact that here this obviously looks like a time, I can rewrite in terms of a static quantity. All right, so let's look at the moment. e to the power of n of my energy distribution. This is a moment of a Fourier transform of a temporal correlation. And let's see whether I can rewrite it such that in the end it is a static quantity and if I can do that, so something which does not depend on this time difference here, um, if I can do that then we can try to simulate this by Monte Carlo integration again. Okay, so let's rewrite this a little bit. Um, um, well, so this is still the DE over 2 pi, this is just for normalization purposes. The only energy is to now I plug in, of course, the definition. Uh, the only energy dependence is here, of course, in this exponential. So if I want to calculate e to the power of n times this exponential, I can do that by taking derivatives of this exponential. This brings down factors of e. Okay, so let me write this down quantitatively. Of course, this brings down factor of i e, so I want to get rid of these i's here. I do n many derivatives with respect to t, and I write down a partial derivative here because the whole thing also depends on e. Um, and 
and um, the rest is well, what we had before here. Some operator. <coughs> Um, yeah, this correlation function here. Okay, I hope you see you will see that if I take t derivatives of this, I get i times e to the power of n. I divide by i to the power of n, so this is what's left. Okay, now um, well, having partial derivat having derivatives acting on this, I can rewrite that by integrating by parts n times into an expression where these derivatives act on this quantity and not on the exponential anymore. Um, basically with the assumption that at t minus infinity and t plus infinity uh, I don't have any non-trivial operators, particles and so on around. Um, Okay, so, um, well, doing n integrations by parts gives me first of all an overall minus 1 n times, so minus 1 to the power of n, and I have this 1 over i to the power of n, and I have, uh, well, of course, still this energy integration here. and the time integral. Now I have this exponential function. I have a d dt, uh, dn dtn acting on this correlation function. <coughs> okay, I just integrated this here by parts. Um, and since this here only depends on t and not on e, I switched here to total derivatives. Up here I have partial derivatives because there is an e and a t dependence because these are my two integration variables here. All right. Um, okay, so these derivatives obviously act on this one operator, so this is the nth derivative of this operator. And the other thing I can do is I can evaluate this integral e over the exponential because there is nothing else which depends on the energy. This is what I have achieved by rewriting this e to the power of n as derivatives. I have achieved that the only energy dependence now is in the exponential. All the rest has been translated to a time dependence. Okay, so this is 1 over i to the power of n minus 1 to the power of n. Now I do this e integration over the exponential. What does that give me? Integral over exponential. Same exponential, and then you have uh, uh, divided by et. Yes, I uh, integrate here from minus infinity to plus infinity. Oh, no. Okay, well, now you're integrating on the t or the e? I integrate the e. Ah, okay, then you have uh, uh, the e. So when is minus when you substitute with minus infinity, then it's zero the exponential. Because it's ah oh, okay, but you have the e et. Uh, you get a zero. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if uh, if t is zero, this is one, and then I integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity over one, which is infinite. Whereas for every other value of t, uh, I mean, basically, then it, it averages out, which is zero, that's what you said. Mm -hmm. So there is one specific value of t where it's not zero, and in total, this is a delta function. Okay? Um, so I do this integral here, and this is a delta function times 2 pi, and this 
uh, drops out with a 1 over 2 pi here, so there is an integral dt left, this I still have, times the delta of t, and this here is the nth derivative of this operator um, O dagger. So just let me write it like this. This here means nth derivative. And now I can do the T integration. has only one contribution when t is zero, which means I can replace here t by zero. So this is the um, following function. I have the nth derivative of this operator here evaluated at time equals zero times the, anyway, this operator at zero. So this quantity does not depend on time anymore, which means this here is a static quantity. How is that in practice? Well, from a mathematical point of view, if I can calculate all moments of this distribution, I actually can reconstruct the whole distribution. I mean, typically, you would, I mean, this is a distribution, well, I mean, a typical shape would be something which is zero, a plus and minus infinity, and have a bump somewhere, or have several bumps. Okay, this is like a frequency spectrum in, well, uh, in electromagnetism. Um, well, suppose this does not look too complicated. What I would be interested in is then the average value of my distribution. This I would get by having n equal 1. <coughs> I'm interested then in the standard deviation, in the deviation from the average, the, the, the average deviation from this mean value, which I obtain basically by calculating the, uh, for n equal to this moment, and subtract from that uh, the mean value square, and so on. Then I can uh, calculate the skewness, uh, which is the asymmetry between left and right uh, of the mean value, and so on. So strictly speaking, I can get a lot of information about this distribution by calculating these moments. And all these are static quantities, so strictly speaking, um, I can calculate that numerically by the usual techniques. However, there is a limitation to that. And the limitation is all this is done on a grid. All this is done on a lattice. And these here are derivatives. But well, derivatives on a lattice are typical differences of values between the lattice sides. And higher derivatives involve more different lattice sides. And at some point there is a limitation because I do not have infinitely many lattice sides. I only have a finite number of lattice sides, so I cannot simulate arbitrarily high derivatives because this would involve more lattice sides than I have, which means uh, that I'm running out of information. So in practice, uh, there is a limitation to that. And um, I mean, what lattice QCD at the moment addresses are actually first and second moments and not whole distributions. But actually, it turns out that these pattern distributions, they do not look too complicated. That's actually something, a general statement about physics. Typically, distributions do not look more complicated than necessary. So, 
contribution, typical distributions have a bump somewhere and not 10 to the 10 bumps. Okay? Um, so there is a practical limitation to that, but otherwise we can address that also by Monte Carlo. Um, discretization of derivatives. But otherwise, um, I mean, this is a very good method to learn something about temporal distributions or its corresponding Fourier transforms. Okay, now finally uh, we come to quantum field theory. And also this is something which I want to do in two steps. First, write down the general expressions for an arbitrary quantum field theory, and only then um, we'll talk more about lattice QCD and the strong interaction. Okay, so far I talked about quantum mechanics, but always with this motivation later on we will talk about quantum field theory. Now we do that. Okay, in quantum field theory, we talk about uh, Lagrange densities, which then will also cause Lagrangians again. And this Lagrange density or Lagrangian is a function of the fields. And now let me be completely generic and just label the fields by phi a. And this is not only a function of phi a, but also of its derivative. integrals for quantum mechanics and this here is say part integrals for quantum field theory. So that's a new a new general bullet. Uh, okay, I have it right here. Now this is not another example. So these are two examples on static quantities, but now we completely finish this uh, uh, part on on quantum mechanics and go to quantum field theory. Okay, now what I tried to stress already several times is quantum field theory is basically a bunch of quantum mechanics in a sense that at every space point one has a quantum mechanics um, with the addition that the space points are now coupled. So on every space point I can excite my amplitude psi a, my several amplitudes psi a, uh, phi a, sorry. Um, and I do this on every space point and then the whole thing I call quantum field theory. Which means I can completely translate what we did for a one particle quantum mechanics to this basically many particle quantum mechanics, which is quantum field theory. So, whatever was the spatial coordinate of my one degree of freedom becomes now the field value of my, well, degree of freedom, the field. And of course I have to do that for every field, and I have a field at every space point. And I have to integrate over all time steps. Um, and basically I repeat now the same statements from last time, which I've written down for quantum mechanics, I repeat now for quantum field theory. 
So for any operator, I have again an operator O, which now does not depend on space, on a space variable. So the space vari variable would be my degree of freedom one dimensional. Now my variables are the fields. So this operator depends on my phi A's. Um, or can express uh, uh, the expectation value with respect to the vacuum as a part integral. which looks like that. So I have my vacuum state here, um, my operator, which depends on these fields. I normalize to the vacuum state. If it's normalized to one, I can drop that. Um, but it's useful actually also to write the path integrals as a um, as a fraction, and now I integrate over all fields at all positions at all well discretized times. I have this operator here, and this is weighted by e to the minus s, which is the action of these <coughs> fields. And I normalized by the same expression just without this operator here. So this is a nice formal expression, but one cannot address this by Monte Carlo because of these i's here. However, if the operator is time independent, going on, um, I add here also that the volume of where I look at my field well, should also become big. Uh, this will show up again in a moment. And I again build this ratio of integrating over all fields. However, now weighted with a so-called Euclidean action, which depends on beta and this volume, normalized to the same expression without this operator. And, um, okay, so this whole thing here The idea is that one evaluates this here by Monte Carlo. And of course I should tell you how one obtains this SE. <coughs> the SE of beta V is um, an 
integral zero to beta d tau, while in the understanding that in reality this is actually a sum over the different discretized uh, tau points here. And uh, there is, in the same sense, an integral over the whole volume of three-dimensional space with the so-called Euclidean action. And the Euclidean action one obtains from the ordinary one, which is here, by this trick of rewriting the time variable. <clears throat> well, where does the time variable show up now? Actually, it shows up in these time derivatives of the fields. So there I should tell what uh, changes. So I replace the d0 which is d dt by something imaginary by e d d tau which um, one actually calls i times d zero Euclidean. So one takes whatever theory one is interested in, for example QCD, replaces the time variables and the time derivatives by what correspondingly occurs. Also whenever one has a time variable, this becomes minus i times tau. And therefore, here I have the denominator, 1 over minus i times tau, which brings the i here in the numerator. And, uh, well, then one rewrites the Lagrangian as a function of this tau variable instead of a time variable. And the whole thing uh, will actually yield an expression which is real and negative. Well, again, it might not be negative concerning its potential energy which enters there. But if the potential energy has a lower bound, one can basically uh, rewrite the numerator and denominator such that, no, I should talk about here, the numerator and denominator, sorry, such that this exponent here is negative. And then I have e to the minus something, and this is exactly what one wants. Then again, one can interpret this exponent here and the whole denominator as a probability distribution and uh, well generate different field configurations uh, by random numbers and average over whatever operator one is interested in. For example, these operators which we discussed in the first half of uh, this lecture. Okay, now, um, so far so good. In principle, this is the way how to do that. Um, there is again one thing which I have to add. And this is, I have not told you so far how to deal with fermions. Why is that an issue? Well, I've motivated for you how things work with quantum mechanics. Now quantum mechanics are, well what I said before it was only half true, I said quantum field theory is always a couple of quantum mechanics coupled to each other uh, well, concerning the different space points. This is actually true for bosons. Because bosons satisfy commutation relations which exactly correspond to the elementary commutator between position and momentum. So this very elementary thing which basically defines quantum mechanics, uh, which gives rise to the uncertainty relation. Um, for fermions it's different. Fermions satisfy um, anti-commutation relations. So in that sense there is no, um, it's not so simple to, de 
to define a quantum mechanics of, of fermions, at least this is not like uh, going from a classical mechanical system to a quantum mechanical system. Obviously fermions are different. One can also say fermions do not have a classical limit. And this is an issue here because I was very proud when I derived that uh, to say, well, we have a couple of integrals. That's the bad thing about it. This is complicated to do, but actually one can do it numerically. But we have got rid of all operators. We have got rid of expectation values, operators. We did not need to know any single wave functions and so on. So everything reduced to numbers. A lot of numbers, but one can deal with that numerically. And this is just not true for fermions. For fermions, this does not reduce to numbers because fermions do not have a classical limit. Fermions are different from well, bosons, and bosons are more similar to I mean, the quantum mechanical setup. So we have to do something for fermions. And this is essentially, uh, well, merely a definition. One has to write down something which um, reproduces quantum field theory, as one knows it. And this something is, is simple for... Uh, this something is actually straightforward to write down, because in most of the cases of practical interest, the fermion fields in the Lagrangian appear in squares. And if one has a path integral with something appearing in squares, well, this is like a Gaussian integral. And this is something one can formally generalize to fermions. And uh, I will do that next time. But just to, to set the stage for that, that you really know what is done in lattice QCD, um, let me introduce one more concept which will be important for the fermions. And this is the uh, generating functional. <coughs> the generating functional is again something one formulates with path integrals, actually completely general, independent of what exactly operators one is interested in. And it's based on the following observation. What we actually are interested in are not arbitrary operators, but polynomials of these fields. I've given you already an example for that. For example, a three-quark operator which has the quantum numbers of the proton. So then I would write down just three quark fields, which is a polynomial in quark fields, the product of three fields. For mesons, one would write down a quark-antiquark combination, again a product of fields. This is typically what one is interested in, in a product of a couple of fields or maybe a sum of such products. Um, okay, so The interesting operators are polynomials <coughs> of the fields uh, phi A and their derivatives. What we want to do now is we want to generate them formally by taking derivatives of an exponential. Well, I've done this already once, not for fields, but for a number. And this is here. I generated here a polynomial in the energy by taking derivatives of an exponential. 
And this we can use now and also write down an exponential from which we obtain by taking derivatives with respect to the fields from which we obtain, uh, well, the fields we are interested in. And this is what one calls generating, uh, well, basically these polynomials. So with them I mean the operators. Well, now I want to take derivatives not with respect to a variable, but with respect to fields, with respect to functions, and that's why this is not a normal derivative of a function, but actually it's a derivative of a functional a function of a function. Um, So I generate them from functional derivatives in the following way. So suppose I have a field which I want to know at a position x. And then I do the following. I take a derivative with respect to a new function, which one calls source of an exponent where I basically cut on linearly the function I'm interested in and the, uh, and the source here. First of all, just read that as if there were no, as if there was no integration here. So suppose this would be like my exponent of well, one variable times another one. I'm interested in this variable to some power, for example, linear. Then I would take one derivative of this here divided by 1 over i. This is exactly this here. I take a derivative with respect to this variable j, and this brings me essentially, if you forget for a moment about this integral, this brings down a factor i times phi, the i goes away, and afterwards I put j to 0 after doing this, which means I put the exponent to 1. So this derivative just produces phi times the exponent with j equals 0 afterwards the exponent becomes 1 and what's left is this. The only difference now is that this is not one <coughs> variable <coughs> but it's a function itself. It is a function of position and time which I sum over here. And I could imagine that this is a discrete sum and then I do it for one particular space time point, for this one. And then this sum here for all other space time points is irrelevant because I ask for this space time point. So the rest anyway drops out. Uh, one can also formalize this a little bit by, um, by basically defining what is the elementary uh, derivative, functional derivative, of, um, uh, say, for example, of j. And otherwise, all the rules how to do um, differentiation just apply in the usual sense. Um, <clears throat> so this basically should give a value if all indices and the space-time points agree, and since the indices are discrete and the space-time is continuous, there is a discrete and a continuous delta function here. What is this good for? So let me first calculate the simplest example. If I have um, if I a, so let me 
let me, well, now a little bit more uh, specific about all these indices here. So this is an integral over all phi b's with arbitrary b's. Um, then I want a, well, a complete object here, phi a of x. And my function also depends on all fields here, so I could take phi b for example here. Um, and I can obtain this in the following way, basically by adding this exponential. So I could do this by taking a derivative with respect to the source at the position I'm interested in of um, this path integral here, and now I write it as an exponent. Um, I write down explicitly the action, which is um, a four-dimensional integral over the Lagrange function, plus um, by b of y um, jb of y. And after performing this derivative, which brings down, well, this here does not depend on j, the only j dependence is in here, and this brings down a phi in front of the exponent. Um, after doing that, after performing this j derivative, I put j equals zero, that I really, in the exponent, end up with my original action. Now let me give a name to all these uh, quantities here. This here is now a function, a functional, which depends on this j, on this source. So this I call c of j um, b. Um, however, I want to normalize that actually to the same object without the source. So I Right here, times integral b e by b e to the i s. And uh, then I can bring this here, which anyway does not depend on j, I can bring this to the other side and normalize this object, which is anyway what I want. Um, and I can actually do this now several times. I can do this as often as I like for different um, phi's, and then the whole expression looks like this. I have any operator here which depends on my phi a, e to the i s, I normalize by phi b, e to the i s, and this I can actually write as well, if I have one phi, I have one such a derivative, and if I have a couple of them, I have a couple of such derivatives. So in general, I have exactly the structure which my operator gives. So I can write this as an operator of these derivatives. J A acting on this uh, so-called generating functional, and in the end evaluate it at j equals zero. Okay, the reason why I've written this here down is because we will use that next time to understand how one treats fermions, uh, well actually in QCD, because from next time on, uh, or next time specifically, we will repeat all this, but for one specific theory, which is the theory of the storm interaction. Okay, then this was it for today. Let's see you on Thursday, and there I will show you results and interpret uh, what